So today we talk with Lee Ron, the founder and CEO of Weka, that just raised $140 million Series E this May at a $1.6 billion valuation. In total, they raised $415 million. This is a very different type of company because this is very much a deep tech company. And not just deep tech, it sells to large enterprises. So you can imagine it took a long time to build the first product and get it to market. In fact, Liron started in 2013 and didn't really get the product to market, the GA, until about 2018, 2019. So it took like over five years. And the simplest way I can describe what Weka does is, and, and I think somebody that really gets it might kill me, but I think for everybody else, the simplest way to think about it, it's almost like this OS that runs on GPUs and helps GPUs run 20 times faster. The simplest way that Liron described it to me is like without Weka, your GPUs are operating at like maybe 30% capacity and with Weka, they're operating at 90%. So you can imagine in today's world why there's so much demand from enterprises for Weka's product. But it took a long time and a lot of money for Laurent to get this to market. He raised a $10 million Series A and then a $25 million Series B when he had no revenue. And so we dive deep into what exactly he had to do to get real validation from customers, to know that he was building something that actually would have demand once he built it. And what he had to do to go out and raise all of this money without any actual revenue. We also talk about Liron's prior startup, which raised a bunch of money, but ultimately failed, and why the best way to win is to play to your strengths. Welcome to the Product Market Fit Show, brought to you by Mistral, a seed stage firm based in Canada. I'm Pablo. I'm a founder turned VC. My goal is to help early stage founders like you find product market fit. Liron, welcome to the show. Thanks, Pablo. Thanks for having me. So, you know, today you're running Weka and, you know, that, that's that been a huge, huge success so far. I mean, hundreds of employees, hundreds of millions of dollars raised. Before that, we were chatting and you told me that you started another company called Fusic, which was kind of like TikTok-ish, uh, except it didn't work <laughs> nearly as well as Weka or as TikTok. Curious to, to kind of hear that story and, and what that was and kind of how that went. In 2011, we left IBM after they've acquired their previous company when when we left IBM we we left it with a huge sense of hubris basically any anything we would do is going to turn up being uh, an incredible success why was that by the way just things were going really well at IBM yeah we've created a great product before IBM acquired us for a lot of money the product within IBM uh, was selling like hot cakes up uh, Obviously, in the retrospect of Wacka, if you slab like the IBM logo on many other products, it would probably sell well. Uh, That's the help. We yeah. grew, <laughs> we, but we grew incredibly fast and faster than anything you could imagine working from a smaller company. Uh, and we, th- we said, hey, we've, we've created such a good product before. We got it to scale such big sizes at IBM. We, we can do anything. And then mobile was starting video on the internet was just starting and we said hey let's let's help teenagers generate content the cloud was ramping up we figure out hey we could actually let them record themselves singing and dancing alongside uh video clips from youtube and youtube just realized how how they can get the rights to to put music on on the internet and Obviously, it's going to be a huge, huge, huge uh, success. We created this platform, great technology. In seconds, you would upload your video and uh, you you could end up seeing yourself singing alongside, dancing alongside the video clip. We raised tons of money in that context, dozens of millions of dollars, because anyone saw that said, hey, obviously, it's going to be a huge hit. What was, I mean, there was a lot of trends. I mean, you had you had mobile... You had like YouTube obviously taking off and then so all these kind of things came together and people figured, oh, this is going to be just as massive as all the other kind of social plays. Yes. And then, you know, the iPhone 4 just came out and you had the front facing camera. You could say, hey, you could generate your own your own content. But then a few things happened. One, teenagers, especially back then, didn't have the latest phones. So they didn't have front facing cameras. You usually think about kids yourself. You're not giving them. Maybe now it's it's more accepted to go buy a kid an expensive phone. I think back in 11, 12, it definitely was not the case. So kids didn't have their own phones. If they did have it, they didn't have the latest model phone. 
Uh, so in order to record the video, you need to have like a friend hold an older devices. Yeah, because back then, I mean, people were still using what, like, I mean, probably some people still had flip phones. A lot of people probably had Blackberries, if I remember correctly. Yep. So the quality of the videos recorded, like what we were running in our QA was great because we did have the latest ones. <laughs> right. But what teenagers had and, you know, connectivity we've had in in our office was great, but connectivity people had all over it's it's difficult to remember, hey, how underwhelming the internet was 15 years ago. So while we've created a product that was a no-brainer and was supposed to be a huge hit, it wasn't. How far did you get? Like, I'm just curious, like, in terms of usage, did you spend a lot of money kind of in the advertising side and actually got a lot of downloads, but just no usage? Or was it never, were you never even able to kind of get that that initial adoption just because the hardware and and the internet and everything around it kind of wasn't there yet. So we actually, back then, doing interactive things with music was a huge, huge thing for the music industry because they were all trying to figure out how do they interact with their fans? How do they bring on uh, more adoption? People thought, hey, maybe through the internet, there would no not be any concerts anymore. So we, we, we've we had the most incredible reception from the studios. So we were having campaigns back then, Justin Bieber, One Direction, oh, wow. Ariana Grande, these huge, 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 huge uh, artists. And they would launch their singles. They would launch their uh, their video clips with us. We would get millions of people come in dozens of thousands of of recordings they would win prizes like we got them to win concert tickets and whatever but then we couldn't get them to come to come back again the following month so or the following week cuz the friction of going through like if Justin Bieber posts like a, a short clip on his back then twitter tells you there is a context, asks you to come, you would figure out your your two friends, one's going to hold the camera, one's going to help you, you'd get the video. But unless you you, you have a, a strong need, you wouldn't go through all the friction of generating more content. And once the big con- contest was over and and we got the winner announced, there was very little interest on coming back to these pages. It's incredible like how you, you realize how many things need to align and go right to create like an Instagram, a Snapchat, a YouTube, like these content platforms that also require retention, right? And like daily active usage and consistent creation. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's not easy. And that's why there's only so you know few companies that ended up being big winners in those spaces. So I'm curious, like, how do you go from a company like that, the sort of company that a non-deep tech VC like me can understand, to Weka, <laughs> something that, uh, you know, is a little bit beyond <laughs> beyond the sort of things that, that I get and something that is just so technologically complicated, right? Not consumer, it's enterprise. I mean, it's it's almost everything that Fusic is not. Right. So with with Fusic, we basically said, hey, we've, we've created a deep tech company once, we got a lot of reception in the enterprise, but the enterprise was is difficult. Deep tech is difficult. You have to spend all that energy. Consumer is going to be so much more <laughs> straightforward. Uh, we, we've tried that. Uh, was part of the hubris. But you know, when when we left IBM, we've said we don't want to do enterprise. We don't want to do data management storage anymore because we felt the market was broken. Uh, it's insanely fragmented. It's a huge, huge market, like $150 billion uh, annually, but hundreds of products that, that sell and no product scales to more than a few billion dollars annually. So customers end up running any any number between 10 and 50 through tons of silos and vendors have to have a big complicated portfolio. So we didn't want that. Also, the delivery even though these are software products, most of them have some proprietary hardware component in them. So you're buying software in in the hardware box. What's an example of that, by the way? So you can look at companies like NetApp, and NetApp has like 
four or five different boxes you can buy, whether you're buying their ONTAP or E-Series or a bunch. If you're looking at even younger companies like Pure Storage, they have the line of Flash Array, which is one set of hardware. They have another line of the Flash Blade, a different set of hardware. EMC has, I don't know how many different hardware platform EMC has. So all of these companies, um, you know, Hewlett Packard. So all of these companies have these very, very dense portfolios. And even within the portfolio, each product comes on a different proprietary box because they need some some different help from different hardware components. On premises, it's just hard. It adds friction. Uh, but it also means that none of these products that run very well on on premises are going to run well on on the public cloud. Back in eleven, and definitely thirteen when we started Weka, we we thought that cloud is just around the corner. Obviously, it took another decade and a worldwide pandemic for enterprise to start adopting the cloud. So another, I think, another interesting question of product market fit. But back in thirteen, we were fortunate uh, to go through three huge, huge tech step functions. One, containers started happening. It was before the days of Kubernetes and Docker, but containers started happening. The ideas of microservices, hey, you can take a big platform, chop it down to tiny little pieces and run it across uh, many servers was starting to form. It's a, it's a very, very different way of thinking about how do you run a data center to Flash uh, was really happening with uh, a standard called NVMe. There were probably 50 companies that were trying to make NVMe, to trying to make Flash natively uh, connected to CPUs. You may remember names like Fusion IO, Virident, File in Memory, Texas Memory Systems. They all had their proprietary approaches and, and became billion-dollar businesses. Then the industry said, wow, that's a great idea, a great need. If 50 companies can do it, it's not so difficult. So there was very little tech mode, uh, but there was no standardization. They created a standard that happened to not suck called NVMe. And now the whole industry basically transitioned. When we started Weka, NVMe was a PDF. That PDF made so much sense. And we said, that's, that standard's going to win. And that was a standard, to be clear, for, for flash memory? Is that For how, to, how do you connect flash to modern CPUs? So people have been using flash in their mobile devices. You've had your disk on keys. So the consumer space have really adopted flash. But the data center hasn't because there was no reasonable way that was standard to basically attach these flash devices to, to modern servers. And NVMe created that. Why? The third thing that happened was networking. Uh, and networking speed, again, got the step function that in essence was probably 100 times in, in a few years. We took these three very big step changes in what's possible. And then we've said, hey, you can actually create a different kind of data management product that doesn't have performance limitation, doesn't have scale limitation, doesn't have the form factor limitation. You can run the exact same thing on premises and the cloud. Um, basically, what we're doing, we came with a way of virtualizing data like VMware had virtualized compute. Obviously, it took us many, many years to get this product to market because uh, there was a bunch of fundamental computer science, fundamental technology that we had to go through, and a lot of customer, customer interactions in between, just making sure, hey, we're not drinking our own Kool-Aids, uh, we're we're building something customers would want. And this is a really simple question, but just to make it very kind of tangible, these are all, you know, these kind of three big tech innovations, microservices, uh, Flash, you mentioned networking. When you're talking to a customer, like, just give me a sense of who is that customer? I know they're large enterprises, but who's an example of that customer? And like, 
with with what you're leveraging these technologies for, what do they get? And then what's kind of the ROI for them? Like what's the business case? How do they think about these purchases? Yeah, so one of our early customers that, you know, sort of serendipity uh, that we're talking to before we actually realized, hey, that's going to be a huge uh, a huge part of our go-to-market in the future was Nuance. I uh, don't know if you remember in the early 2Ks, they had the dragon dictation. They were very s- strong on voice recognition. So we're going to them. That's basically the first time that we've uh, witnessed anyone that's using GPUs to actually solve an enterprise problem, an AI problem. That was before AI was cool. Uh, o- obviously, they they were solving an interesting problem and, and they were a good in, company. In the kind of dictation. So like they're doing like text, to, uh, you know, uh, speech to text, sorry, using, and they leveraged GPUs to actually get this done. They, they did. A decade ago. Wow. And, and they've, what they were doing was like, they were the pioneers of the pioneers. That's because. It's early. Anyway. It's hard to realize like a decade ago doing that, that is early. <laughs> Very early. Obviously back then we didn't, when we were going on one of the first POCs with them, one of the first, like they've, they've been running an, an, an alpha, it was not even a fully functioning all-around product, but they, they had the hunch that this could help them. Um, it was interesting for us. We were talking with a lot of the big uh, secretive hedge funds on Wall Street because they care about scale and performance and latency so fundamentally, like take take Nuance or these hedge funds is a great example. Like Nuance, they're running uh, like like we said, Texas Speech or Speech Attacks kind of dictation services. They need GPUs in their case to process a bunch of this data. And for them, your solution means faster, cheaper, more reliable. These are the sort of kind of value props that they get. Yes, and they were using some other storage product from IBM. Uh, traditionally, it was an older file system called GPFS. Throughout the years, it has changed names, and 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 they they were experiencing operational performance scale issues, and they wanted to see, hey, would using Weka help us solve uh, these problems? And Weka is just pure software that kind of gets added to whatever stack they already have, or how do they implement your product? Right. So we're, on the one hand, pure software. On the other hand, we do require hardware to run on. So we need these servers with the fast networking and the flash devices. We normally come and replace whatever other data management product you're running. So we're not, we don't augment it because the problems we solve are fundamental. So it's difficult to solve scale and performance if what you're using doesn't scale any slow. So we, what we're doing, we're running on standard rackable servers that have a relatively strong CPU, uh, fast networking. Nowadays, it could be one or two, 400 gig NICs, uh, a bunch of flash on NVMe devices. Then we're pooling these resources and we're making the equivalent of what otherwise would be an appliance that you're buying. Similarly, we're doing the same thing on cloud where we would be running on instances that have fast networking and flash devices. And then we give the exact same value value prop, the exact same feature set on the cloud like you can get on-prem. Also, we have a bunch of features around pushing data between different systems. So we can enable a hybrid cloud. We can enable you to to start a workload on-prem and then migrate it to the cloud and or start from one cloud and, and push to another cloud if you can get better uh, better pricing on your resources, for, uh, for example. Is this, and again, this might be a stupid analogy, but can you think of this kind of like an OS for these CPUs, for these these servers, or is that not like like the same way Mac OS is for a PC or, or Windows for a PC or whatever? This is in a similar place in the stack for kind of these GPUs, CPUs, or, or not really? It's like an OS. Uh, we actually have implemented ourselves 
a lot of the functionality you would get in an operating system. So we're running our own networking stack, we're running our own IO stack, we're running our own scheduler. So we can run alongside Linux, but we've we've actually implemented our own hardware level hypervisor that allows you to curve a portion of that server out where we run. One way we can run is it is as a dedicated appliance. The other way we can run is actually you can converge Weka on the exact same servers you're running your application. At that point, you're getting even more efficiency. Walk me through what happens through that POC because this is the difference. This is where I, th- I find at least that most deep tech and other, let's say, non-deep tech startups diverge in the sense that product market fit for a non-deep tech company is usually not about can you build it, it's more about will they come? Like, can you actually build something people love and so on? In many cases in deep tech, because you get to go kind of so far out, you almost know like if you can deliver this sort of improvements on performance, reliability, or or whatever it is, they will come. But the question is, you know, can you actually build it? So what, what happens during that, you know, 2013 to 2016, 17 phase? Yeah, but by the way, in deep tech, there is a big risk on are you solving the real pain points? And we're, I think we're seeing a lot of deep tech companies that come and they either don't solve a pain point that's uh, painful enough or the pain point that they're solving is not scalable enough. I can give you tons of examples of great technologies that that didn't make it. And that's, I think, the highest risk because as an engineer, as a tech person, you can get, you can fall in love with solving an interesting problem, but then you realize that the market actually doesn't think it's an interesting enough problem for the large enterprise companies, I'm talking about deep tech for enterprise, for IT infrastructure, people have to realize these companies run and they have run with the current stack and making changes is a huge risk. Buying from a no-name company is a huge risk. You may not be there. And all of these buyers have made that a mistake of picking something that looks like a cool technology from a company that didn't make it, only to go and revert to the tried and true big players that at least you know are going to be there next year. So you need to pick up not something that you can solve, but something that you think you can solve that has a big enough pain to enough customers that you can show that you actually can scale. And then you need to do it in a way that convinces them that you're a safe bet. So it's a great point. Like, but how do you manage to to validate that up front? Because again, the difference is with non deep tech. You know, it really sucks to go after a pain point that isn't a real pain point. But at least you wasted probably a handful of months, you know, a million dollars building something, MVPing it. It didn't work. Like with deep tech, you don't get to a product that quickly, and so it's really important that up front. You do something to to validate that. So, like, how how did you know that if you if you built it and it worked, you would have buyers? So we went through a bunch of of these POCs, POVs very early. We tried to figure out with these customers, hey, where do you suffer the most? We tried to figure out where where could we find a repeatable case where customers suffer a lot. Uh, for a period, we thought. Maybe hedge funds, the problem that hedge funds, there aren't enough of them. So it's difficult to build a company off of hedge funds and unless you charge insane amount of money. But even then, you're like a lifestyle business. We, we went through life science and we probably could have reached similar growth through life science, but we've, we would have had to spend a lot more resource because life science customers are a lot more conservative. It takes longer time to convince them. And then through 17 and then 18, what what has happened is this growth of AI problems, GPUs, all of these folks realized, hey, AI with neural networks are 
really great at solving difficult issues, difficult problems. There is obviously tons of money in, in solving these problems. All of them have the problem of performance and scale, which is two of the few things that we solve so much better than, than anyone else. We've started working with one of the most ambitious self full self-driving projects out of the Bay Area. And, and we've basically aligned ourselves to, to them. When was this? That was, so during the second half of 2017, we proved to them that our value prop, what we can bring them, is so much better than anything they can get out of the, out of the incumbents. So they were, they were trying to run on a pure storage. Pure was saying back then that they're the best solution for AI. They were a much bigger company than us. And when you're talking about AI, you have this concept of time, time to epoch. How long does it take you to go through one cycle? What we were showing them is that we were able to shorten their time to epoch from about 14 days to four hours. So... It means so that, that point, it's if, speed, like it's not just money saved. It's actually you get to develop your product that much faster. Yes. It's a competitive and, edge. Yep. And basically, if you're running one epoch after the other and you're consistently so much faster, it means that a, a full week on, on the WACA ended up being more output than a year on the incumbents. At that point, it's it's a no-brainer. You take the risk. And... You know, they tried to down negotiate us on price, but we realized we've, we have a big, big edge. Like the incumbents were trying to say, all right, we'll give it to you for free. That's a great tactic. Big companies employ to try and kill new entrants. So if you can make sure the, the first dozen customers that want to buy from the new, new entrants get your product for free, you basically suffocate the new entrant and, and they don't make it. And a lot of deep tech companies that don't show big enough differentiation between, hey, you get the offer of not paying, the risk is too high. Free is, they, hard, they... free is hard to compete with and there's credibility behind it. So yeah, you've really got it. And this is where I think it's so important, the type of ROI, which which at least for me is really what, what shines here is like, it's not just we're saving you time, we're saving you money, which, you know, okay, that's impactful, but like you save me money, they're free, <laughs> you know, that, that stuff. It's we're helping you do what you do every day that much faster, right? That's a competitive exactly. edge that you can't you can't really say no to if you're serious about winning a certain category, right? And that's core to what you do. Uh, you you kind of have to, as you said, it's a bit of a no brainer. You got to go for yes. And basically, when when they were buying us instead of taking the free, we we knew we've had it. So and how? By the way, that's another question. Like pricing, like how do you even? What is the business model and what's an average kind of ACV given these sort of larger enterprise customers? So we actually tried innovating around the the pricing and business model and what would customers pay for. And that's the one place that we've decided that we're going to be boring. The industry charges for capacity. And and we, we end up taking a, a subscription based on the, the capacity. So it's an annual subscription based on capacity under management. We tried performance gain. We tried how many servers use it. We tried overall a bunch of things. It makes the comparison of worker to the incumbents too difficult. It changes. It makes it. Uh, too hard for the customers to imagine how much they would be paying in the long term. Um, and and while we probably could have charged more or we could have made it a more acute difference, hey, that's what the value you're getting, this is what you're paying for, we've, we've decided Reducing friction is more important than charging for the absolutely right parameter. And we're just charging like the rest of the industry. It's funny. I've seen that many times where companies, startups specifically, will go out and charge like, especially when they save somebody, you know, customer revenue, they'll be like, we'll charge a percent of that revenue so that it's a no brainer. Hey, like we're only going to charge you well, a percent of what we sell you. And 
generally speaking, what I've seen, and there's only a handful of examples, is that they, they default ultimately to the industry average. And maybe they do a little pilot to show how much they might save. Then they figure out like, here's an annual contract. And then that's just what they charge. For the reasons you said, it lowers friction. It, it makes the customer not have to think as hard, makes it easier to predict. All these sort of things that aren't necessarily top of mind when you're a founder, but they're certainly top of mind when you're an enterprise customer. Yeah, because at the end of the day, you have your champion. Hopefully, you have someone like an executive sponsor. But then you need to also make your way through procurement. And the procurement folks at enterprise companies are not creative folks. And uh, you, you just want to make sure that any step, like you're proving your value, you're creating the right relationship, you convince them they want to buy. From the time you convince them you want they want to buy to the time you get to PO, you want to make it as quick as you can because the incumbents, once they figure out they may be losing that cake, are going to do anything within their power to go and, and combat you. So you want to make the time at procurement the quickest that you, that you can. And at that point, you just want to show them, hey, you would have paid Pure, you would have paid EMC, you would have paid Neda this amount of dollars. You're, you're going to take these exact dollars and pay Wacker. It's a simple simple thought exercise. And and what are we talking about? Like in general, are we talking 100K, a million, 10 million? Like I can imagine these being pretty big customers. We do have good amount of deals that are uh, seven or eight figures, ARR, uh, but a standard deal is probably, we like deals that are 200, 250 to begin with. Uh, and then when you're comparing them to the on-prem, usually you're buying uh, an appliance for three years. So a 200 or 250 is going to be between 600 and 750K. And then you need to buy the hardware. Normally, the hardware vendors have 50% GP, so it's about twice. So we're talking about for an entry-level business for us, the customer would pay anything between one and one and a half million dollars overall for, overall, for the right. three-year appliance they would be buying. But we're count, but we're going to count. We're going to collect six hundred to seven fifty. But we're going to count as booking uh, the two hundred to two fifty. And how fast? I mean, that's the beauty. Like that's the upside and downside of enterprise. It takes a long time. They're really big procurement processes. Blah blah blah. But when you get them, they really start to pile up and move the needle pretty quickly. Um, how quickly did things take off in like 2018, 2019? Like once you really found this kind of AI GPU use case, how fast did you get 10 customers, you know, a couple million in ARR? So 18 was still, we didn't call that the GA year. We were still running with small number of customers, obviously that car maker, we're trying to figure out how do you come up with a good product. I think also for enterprise and deep tech, there is a huge difference between an MVP, a minimum viable product that you can go and convince a customer you're bringing them value to a minimum lovable product. So we waited until we had the product that reduced enough of the friction so we could start scaling. So we really, really started scaling in 2020. And in 18 and 19, we're keeping it handful of customers. We didn't really care about how much revenue we we're pulling in, but we did care about where are we bringing value? What do we need to solve? How do we integrate? How do you make it simpler for them? And then in 2020, we went through the exercise of scaling up sales, marketing, the other portions to, to really bring and, and start scaling ARR and, and the business. How sharp was that ramp like in, in 2020-ish and in those early years? So we've been doubling year over year for since 2020 until now. We're now eight-figure, uh, sorry, nine-figure ARRs. Wow. So we're doing well. Congratulations. Um, that's the big, for what it's worth, like for, for an outsider is like, that's the big milestone. You know, we celebrate a lot of milestones and they're all important. You know, fundraising is yes, one thing. Being a centurion is good. But yes, being a centaur is, is the thing. That's for sure. This year, actually, we're going to more than double, but that's because, you know, you can track NVIDIA, you can track Azure and the other ones, all, all the AI public company stocks or every company that could actually convinces the, com the, the market, capital A market, they're an AI company, 
they grow like crazy. That's because there is so much pull. And, and at this point, no, th- this, this year we're going to, to grow quicker than, than the plan is. And we're beating the model, not because I think we've, we're hiring great people, uh, but just because, you know, product market fit is, is not a yes, no question. Product market fit is a grayscale. When the product market fit is so strong, when the market is basically pooling, uh, you, you need to have people that are competent and working, and then they're basically beating the, the market. And it makes sense. Like if, if today people, you know, companies, large companies can't get their hands on enough of these chips, on enough of these GPUs, then they better make the most of the ones they have. And, and then Weka is just, again, no brainer. And, and what we're showing them, and it's actually quite straightforward to show, hey, before you've had Weka, you were buying this bunch of GPUs, you've paid millions of dollars, sometimes dozens of millions of dollars, they run at 30% utilization. You bring Weka in, they run at 80, 90% utilization, it almost doesn't matter how much you're paying for the work. And oh, by the way, we cost exactly like the other product. But you're getting three times on your $30 million spent for compute. Yeah, that's that's truly a top of mind problem for, frankly, <laughs> most uh, enterprises today. Let me ask one question that, that's just burning my mind because one of the things when I look at your story, I think, okay, like after 2018, 19, where this kind of AI play with, with GPUs was starting to become clear. I know it was still pilots, but... I understand the story from an investment perspective, like there's a clear narrative to tell there. But I'm looking at fundraising history and you raised 10 million in, in 2014. And then the, the big round that I'm really curious about is $25 million raised in 2016 when given the story you've given me, like things were still pretty unclear then, right? I mean, how does that, how did you make that round happen? Because fundamentally with a company like this, if you don't get funded through it, you know, your runway runs out and, and your revenue is not going to save you. So how did you kind of, yeah, tell me just a little bit about that time and, and that fundraise and, and how you made that all happen. We've used an interesting tactic that proved out well. We kept doing these POCs and POVs. So, and while we couldn't show customers are buying WACA, we were able to get customers to be very excited about the technology we're building. So while, and it is, somewhat reasonable to go and convince. And we, we did re- run the round from a deep tech company. Uh, now it's called Celesta. Their equivalent now is uh, uh, Walden Catalyst. They invest in deep tech companies. They understand the motion. They know how to go interview their customers. The other trick that has worked very well for us, well, trick, uh, it, it did take a lot of work. We've, we've actually funded ourselves through a lot of uh, the strategic players. And now some of them are competitors, but throughout the round B and C, uh, we raised money from Qualcomm and Mellanox and NVIDIA and Micron and Seagate and Western Digital and Hewlett Packard and Cisco and Hitachi. And I probably forgot the bunch. So we had probably the most amount of strategic investors. These folks really understand the market and they can validate that what you're doing is is reasonable. So, you know, getting a single strategic investor is, is a risk. Hey, if they don't like you anymore, what does it say about what you're doing? Having two, maybe not solve it, but we have dozens. So basically, if you can convince the whole industry, the whole very smart investors that work uh, for like what we would be calling strategics, that what you're doing is really differentiated and they want to be part of your cap table, then it helps the VCs because now people that with, with the deep pockets that understand the market validate you. Also, it helps the early customers. Yeah, it gives you credibility, I think, across the board. And it's funny, you say that like a lot of, a lot of founders are wary of taking on strategics because of the signaling risk, because of different terms that they might ask for. So oftentimes they just get zero, but the other choice is to go and get all, to get 10 of them. Yeah, yeah. so I I probably didn't go through all of them. uh, (laughs) It's just like the top of mind ones. And by the way, what was the, 
like for them, what was the story to them? I mean, obviously there's a financial piece where they think they're going to, you know, earn a return, but like strategically, were they thinking they're going to be partners? Were they thinking what exactly? So definitely, you know, if you're looking at companies like Hewlett Packard, Cisco, Hitachi, they would be selling the hardware platforms, Hitachi and Hewlett Packard, they're also storage vendors. If you're looking at the component vendors like Micron, Seagate, Western Digital, Samsung, they want to understand from the forefront what would be needed in a few years. How do they create differentiated products? If they're looking at companies like Mellanox or NVIDIA or Qualcomm, they're a strong ecosystem. Obviously, NVIDIA invested before they became such a great uh, data center company, but they, they had the strong hunch that we would be making a big a big difference in the whole story. Mellanox invested because a part of the reason we could take what we're doing to market is their fast networking. So all of these these companies look at these investments as as a way of peeking into the future. They all have their CTO offices that have ideas, but investing in startups help them validate. Uh, they all want to see which one of them are winning. Makes sense. And their investment census is more around, A, are you looking here at the really differentiated technology? Could that be a, a winning game rather than is that going to wreck on an ARR the fastest? They're, they're, they're not necessarily, a, it's not 100% financial. Makes and that's sense. the way awesome. it works well for, for the deep tech companies, or at least for us, it worked very well. Well, I could I could see that working because that's really, it's this kind of bootstrap motion, right? It's like, who can you get that really will just get it? So some of these strategics will really just get it. Then you leverage that to get maybe a deep tech investor. Then you leverage that to, you know, get the product far enough. At some point you have actual revenues. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh, this makes total sense, right? Everybody else wakes up to it. And end of the day, if you're running a deep tech company and you have a strong belief that what you're doing is differentiated and you're going to hit product market fit, the most important thing is don't run out of money. And there was a period at Waka that the easiest way for me to raise was through these uh, strategics because they understood the story. You go to, to a VC, they, they cannot comprehend the differentiation. And what they want to say, you've been on the road for four years, almost no revenue. You don't have any customers. What you're doing doesn't make sense. What, why I could see that. I mean, I know very few VCs who would get it. And even the ones that who, who would get it, to your earlier point about procurement, they've got to go to their whole partnership and explain it. And there's going to be people in that room that don't get it, no matter how excited the deal lead is. So it's, it's a really tricky kind of uh, dance. So for a while... I was going through the strategics because I could convince them we're differentiated and, and they would give us dollars. And sometimes people forget, but actually the, the dollars are important. You, yes. they, keep you, they keep you up. <laughs> so There's no doubt about that. Perfect. Well, listen, Liron, uh, we'll, we'll stop it there. I'll ask the two questions that we always end on. The first one, I think I know the answer to, but I'll ask it anyways. In the story of Weka, like when did you feel like you had true product market fit? It happened twice. Once I, th I told the story back in end of 17, beginning of 18, we were able to convince that car company that they should pay us instead of getting the product for free. We, we felt, hey, this is a very, very strong hunch that's going to be a good direction. And then the next time in 2020, when we were really starting to build the, the commercial go-to-market team and we're starting to see, hey, you bring on sales people and you're scaling sales and, and and you can get people that have not been with us and are not founders of for an extended period of time and they and they can convince complete strangers to give them six seven figure dollar deals uh it's not easy it wasn't back then obviously if you go retract the doubling a few years it, it they were not huge numbers but i think if you can convince if new employees can convince total strangers to give you a large amount of money, you're onto something. I think that's right. And actually, that's a lot of times where things break. And you will see many companies who get that initial product market fit where it's either founder-led or founder with a handful of people they're really close with. And then when they scale the team, growth doesn't scale and, and there's something else that breaks there. If you could go back 
you know, about a decade now to when you were just starting Weka with one piece of advice for yourself. What might that be? Going through and being VC funded, uh, VCs try to convince you very strongly to go to market and sell earlier. In retrospect, we have tried selling before we had an MVP, before we've had an MLP. I think it's very difficult for the company to realize where it is. I think we've wasted a bunch of resource and efforts back in 17, 18, maybe even 16 to to bring on the revenue. If we could have waited longer, so I don't say don't don't have the customer interaction. Customer interactions are gold, but don't have the interaction in in the sense of trying to get the PO. Have the interaction in the sense of trying to figure out what's going to be your MLP, the minimum lovable product. And how do you make the quickest path to something that provides value but reduces friction? Then when you have something that you think is an MLP, try try to really sell it. Anything before is just going to mount frustration on on both ends. It's pushing on a strength and, and it's the fastest way to burn a lot of money. Yep. Perfect. Well, Iran, that was uh that was amazing. Thank you very much for for jumping on the show. Yeah, thank you. Really enjoyed it. So thanks, Pablo. I just gave you content that you liked so much, you actually listened to the end. And guess what? You didn't pay a single dollar. Not only that, I didn't even put any ads in your face. So you just got a bunch of content for free. And now that I've delivered that value, I'm asking for something in return. Open your app, open Apple Podcasts, open Spotify, open whatever app you use to listen to this and hit that follow button. It's actually going to help you because it's going to help you make sure you don't miss out on the next episode, which you like so much that you listen to the whole thing.